I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our sociology study group. And uh, we'll be meeting in two parts uh, because we're giving two sides of uh, a topic of our growth, uh, which can happen consciously sci as scientists, but also can happen uh, unconsciously. Uh, we can leverage our unconscious. So the first part, uh, Aslam, Kakar uh, will give a presentation of uh, deduction, induction, abduction, three modes of reasoning, um, which uh, the philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce um, distinguished. I will explain how that relates to uh, the language of wisdom, what I call wondrous wisdom, this language of cognitive frameworks. And we'll have discussion about uh, that. <laughs> That will be the subject of this video, how we grow and learn consciously through a learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting what Peirce calls the scientific method of abduction, deduction, induction. And then in a future video, we will have the second part of this meeting. We'll publish that where uh, Christian Nylander talks about how we grow and learn unconsciously through curious listening dialogue. So welcome, and please, uh, Aslam, uh, I invite you to give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. This is uh, so kind of you, and uh, I am um, enjoying this uh, journey with you and our uh, new friends, old friends uh, from our previous uh, discussions. Um, so my name is Aslam Kakar, as Andrea said. I am a PhD candidate um, in global affairs at Rutgers University. Um, my research is sociological, anthropological, so I um, describe myself as a sociologist. Um, and um, uh, it's so good to see you again and to meet uh, our new friends. Um, so as uh, Andreas mentioned uh, in his letter and right now, I'll talk about the modes of reasoning, the typology of reasoning by which individual uh, and society um, approach, formulate their understanding um, of the world. Um, Andreas and I had a brief discussion two weeks ago, um, and then we decided to um, get a better understanding of, uh, you know, what does it mean to reason as individuals and as a society. Uh, and I think it is a good segue to my previous presentation on the grammar of sociology in which I talked about concepts, theories, methodologies, uh, which I use uh, broadly um, um, to, um, you know, inform my approach as a sociologist uh, to social scientific inquiry. Um, and today I'm going to be a bit more specific um, and focus on the three types of reasoning, drawing, drawing on uh, um, Charles uh, Pierce's uh, philosophy. Um, let me briefly uh, say who Pierce was uh, before um, our friend uh, Samuel is here. Um, so I, I was saying, let me briefly introduce uh, Pierce um, uh, before I dig into uh, his philosophy of science. Um, I, uh, hi, Sam. Good to see you. Uh, so the, the, I, I must say that I'm not an expert on Pierce's philosophy, but I'm a student uh, and a curious uh, seeker of understanding of truth. And while uh, um, on that journey, I came across his name and I um, started digging into his work as to who he is and what he, uh, what he did. So... Um, Pierce was the founder of American pragmatism, um, and he, um, a theorist of logic, language, communication, 
uh, and the general theory of science, which he called semiotics. Um, an extraordinarily prolific logician, um, mathematician, uh, and a developer of an evolutionary uh, psychophysically uh, monistic metaphysical system. These are big, difficult words, but um, and I am I have no intention of talking about these uh, things. But this is his introduction. Um, so he. Um, was born in 1839 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and died in 1914 in Pennsylvania. Uh, his writings extend from about 19, 1858, 57, until near his death, which is a period of um, 57 years. His published works run to about 12,000 printed pages. There's a really good article on Stanford Encyclopedia on his introduction. And his known unpublished uh, manuscripts run to about 80,000 handwritten pages. So that's a lot of work. Um, so now I'll move on to um, why I decided to um, focus on uh, Charles Spears. Um, this is because I came across uh, this, this um, method approach that he uses, uh, which is called abduction. Now, um, I'll, I'll share my uh, impressions at the end as to what I think about it. But let me first explain what is abduction. Uh, we know uh, induction and deduction. Um, I'm sure you've heard of these, and I'll go into those in, in a bit. Uh, but let me start with abduction. So in his early writings, Pierce called this type of, um, he, he called um, this the abduction as, as, as an argument, as an hypothesis. Um, he also called it um, uh, retroduction or presumption. Um, abduction, according to him, is the process of arriving at an hypothesis. Um, but the question, as um, Arthur Burks, uh, who was a mathematician um, here at the Institute for uh, Advanced Study in Princeton, he, he asks, for example, in, was a, in one of his articles on Pierce's work, that can the process of arriving at an hypothesis rather than of justifying it be called inference or argument? Right, that's the question. Um, Pierce uh, draws a distinction between um, what he calls logica utens or utens, U-T-E-N-S, and logica docens, D-O-C-E-N-S. Uh, the logica utens of a reasoner, he says, is the undeveloped basis of his reasoning. Uh, I think this links to, in my understanding, to Michael Poliani's uh, uh, distinction between um, inarticulate and articulate knowledge in his work, uh, The Study of Man. Um, so here, uh, Pierce refers to logica utens, you know, of a reasoner, he says it is the undeveloped basis of his reasoning. After careful and systematic study of the process of reasoning, one arrives at a logica docens, which is an improved and scientific theory of logic. So again, as I said, to me, this makes sense in Poliani's terms as the distinction between um, our... Uh, inarticulate, like we all have a sense of the world. We have reasons uh, in our mind uh, about things in our lives around us, uh, but we may not be able to systematically explain, describe why we think the way we think. So the, that probably is the difference between articulate and inarticulate knowledge. So when we systematically study, we, we know the steps, uh, then that knowledge becomes articulate. Um, but I, in my mind, I think all of us think, we are all thinkers. Um, 
I think what makes us, what makes those of us um, different, um, I mean, those who can articulate their knowledge um, is that requires a, a systematic, um, of course, understanding and practice and time and discipline. Uh, so this is this is um, what he means, I think, by logica utens and logica docens. Um, I will also be, you know, as I was reading his work, so there are like terms which I will try to define. So um, I think there are also I see connections between um, between this uh, presentation and um, my first presentation in which I talked about how do we approach um, our understanding? How do we approach understanding the world? So uh, there is a term uh, called belief uh, that comes in his work. So he, um, as a pragmatist, by pragmatism, uh, he refers to um, the logic of abduction and means by, he means by it that it is a logical doctrine to be used in determining the admissibility of hypotheses. Um, in other words, uh, it, for prag pragmatism is a criterion of meaning, it, as it states, an hypothesis, um, that, that an hypothesis has meaning if and only if it has empirical or practical consequences. So that is what he means by um, pragmatism. Uh, so he, as a pragmatist, he believed um, that a belief or he held that a belief is a conscious habit of action. Um, and what we think is to be interpreted in terms of what we are prepared to do. Um, similarly, he, he held that genuine doubt comes about when an actually functioning habit is interrupted. Until a belief habit is actually interrupted, there is nothing which can be subjected to scientific investigation. So um, it, it makes sense to me. I think uh, doubt uh, is, uh, I, I, for me, at the foundation of, uh, I think, uh, a, a human's epistemology. Uh, so it, it, it I can see the connection between what he says and the way I approach my understanding of the world uh, or, or the questions, I mean, my own work. Um, so then he says that, um, he has said that every inquiry whatsoever takes its rise you know, in the observation of some surprising phenomenon, some experience which either disappoints an expectation or breaks in upon some habit of expectation. So this is where the his idea of abduction comes in. So uh, Pierce's, uh, and, and he uses the term uh, uh, evidence, evidencing process um, as expressed through abduction. Uh, which involves a method for reasoning and decision making that focuses on generating the best possible explanations or hypotheses to account for the observed uh, phenomena. And the steps of the evidencing process are surprising phenomenon, phenomena or phenomenon, as I just said, that something that disappoints the expectation or that um, surprises uh, us and, and um, and then he says that the next step is the formation of hypotheses and then the evaluation of hypotheses in which he gives three uh, criteria. Uh, first, economy, uh, how economical uh, an hypothesis is uh, and its plausibility and productive power, right? So which can be observed again and again. Um, and so, um, let me, okay, so then he talks about inquiry. What What is inquiry? So he says once, I think I'm also like explaining the process, the evidencing process, um, which largely comprises his, his uh, theory of abduction. So he says once a belief habit is interrupted, um, the aim is to arrive at a new belief habit, which will prove to be stable. That is one that would lead to the avoidance of all surprise and ideally 
and to the establishment of a habit um, of positive expectation that shall not be disappointed. Uh, and he says, he calls the activity of resolving genuine doubt and arriving at stable belief habits, inquiry. So inquiry for Pierce is the activity of resolving genuine doubt and arriving at stable belief habits. Um, that's inquiry. It's, I think, a very good definition. I had uh, ignored. Uh, this is a very... A uh, straightforward word, but I, I, as I was reading, I thought this is this is a good um, way of defining inquiry. So then, for him, I think this is also the important part of my presentation. For him, abduction, deduction, induction; these are the stages of inquiry. So, as I just defined, inquiry is the activity of resolving genuine doubt and arriving at stable belief habits. And then three stages of inquiry, abduction, deduction, and induction. And these, all these three are based upon the idea of an hypothesis, right? So what is abduction? Abduction, he says, invents or proposes hypotheses. It is the initial proposal of an hypothesis because it accounts for the facts. Deduction, explicates or explains in detail, substantiates hypotheses, uh, deducing from them necessary consequences by means of which they may be tested, right? So deduction is the movement from general to specific. So using principles, theories, to uh, which may be tested. Mm by observing the real world, uh, you know, by, by, by data um, through observation of the real world. And then induction tests or establishes hypotheses. Um, as a believer in the frequency theory of probability, uh, P.S. used the phrase evaluates them. So he, yeah, so induction evaluates hypotheses. And so abduction in this sense is the process of forming an explanatory hypothesis. It is the only logical operation which introduces any new idea. For induction does nothing but determines a value and deduction merely evolves the necessary consequences of a pure hypothesis. Um, so these are uh, some of, uh, I mean, this is, this is um, his uh, theory of abduction or the three stages of uh, reasoning. Um, and then just if, if I have a little bit of more time, I'll just quickly go into a few definitions of, uh, definitions of some key terms. Reasoning, for example, according to, I think this also connects to, uh, in fact, the title of our or the the the, the title of our um, today's uh, session, reasoning: uh, How do individuals and in society reason? So Pierce said that uh, reasoning is thinking which is deliberate and consciously controlled. So it also, I think, makes it clear the two parts of the session: so conscious thinking and unconscious listening. Uh, Andres, I think you said that right. Um, so it's the uh, thinking which is deliberate and consciously controlled. Um, a proof or genuine argument is a mental uh, process which is open to logical criticism. And then he says, a man's reasoning, a man is reasoning when he deliberately and consciously adopts a conclusion because he sees that it follows from the premises in accordance with the method of in accordance with the method or leading principle which he approves and which he consciously sees is applicable to the particular case. I'll read it again. A man is reasoning when he deliberately and consciously adopts a conclusion because he sees that it follows from the premises in accordance with the method or leading principle which he approves and which he consciously sees is applicable to the particular case. Uh, then he says, uh, then 
what he means by inference. Inference, he says, an instinctive or habitual reaction cannot be an inference. He writes that if one does not at all know how one's belief comes about, it cannot be called even by the name of inference. A man is not reasoning until he deliberately approves and consciously applies his habits of thought. It also reminds me of the definition of an intellectual, which is the, I once read in a book that uh, it's the um, relating to life through negotiated thought, right? So relating to life through negotiated thought is what an intellectual is. So a man is not reasoning, he says, until he deliberately approves and consciously applies his habits of thought. Thus, inference is the conscious and controlled adoption of a belief and a belief as a consequence of other knowledge. Um, so I think I will stop here and I will just say that um, uh, that I'm still uh, processing his uh, logic uh, because it, it took him 57 years uh, to really uh, understand uh, his own um, ideas. Um, and I don't think uh, two weeks are enough for me to uh, really, uh, you know, digest uh, these really big, um, deep, um, I mean, ideas. Uh, but I hope uh, the discussion will continue. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it over to uh, Andreas. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Aslam. And uh, I want to say, you know, Aslam um, he is uh, defending his PhD in global affairs as a sociologist by training and is dedicating himself these last several weeks uh, to reading uh, the history of uh, Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, and understanding uh, these modes of reasoning. So we're getting to see uh, him learning this. So now is a good time just for uh, giving questions and maybe I'll be able to answer some of those questions, but what kind of thoughts or questions are coming up as you heard this so far? And hi to Samuel. I'm going to uh, explain um, deduction, induction, abduction, these modes of reasoning of themselves, but also as cognitive frameworks. Okay, so why don't I proceed with that? I'll share my screen. Um, and I think part of the power of what I'm trying to say, maybe um, maybe uh, Aslam will be able to testify to this or not, um, but that once we have a language of wisdom, a language of cognitive frameworks, it becomes possible to have like a set of keys to open up all this knowledge, okay? Can you see the picture of Charles Sanders Pierce, Peirce? Yes? Okay, so let me start. Um, let's just go through deduction, induction, abduction. Um, wh what do they mean? Okay, so these are three types of reasoning. And one of them is absolutely certain. It's the, it's, it's the reasoning of logic. Oh, hi, Jerry is here. So let's say uh, you can see the picture here that all the beans from the bag are white. And let's say that that's true, right? Well, then just logically it follows that some of the beans from the bag are gonna be white. If you just take some of the beans, since all of them are white, then some of them are gonna be white. It's not even very interesting, but that's a type of logical thing. And when you, have comp when you program computers, uh, they can be using that, for example. So that's uh, in terms of certainty. Now induction is, um, a different type of reasoning, almost the opposite type of reasoning. Okay, so if you take out one bean, it's white, another bean, it's white, a third bean, it's white, a fourth bean, it's white. Basically, you see that some of the beans from the bag are white. You get this idea that maybe all of the beans from the bag are white, right? That's called induction. Now, and we use that all the time. So like the sun came up this morning, the sun came up last morning, the sun came up a million mornings. We're kind of expecting it to come up tomorrow morning right? But that's an inductive truth. That's not necessarily logically true. And so there was a huge revolution in thinking when David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, the skeptic, said, look, you don't know that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, right? All you know is because of induction, okay? But maybe you're going to find a bean that's not white, right? Maybe, maybe you know, there's going to be black beans or kidney beans, I don't know. 
Now, so deduction comes back from Aristotle. He used this, uh, you know, he just kind of made this very clear logically. What are the rules at work? Um, induction, I think, maybe became more noticeable, let's say, in the in the early modern times. So certainly Kant drew this distinction uh, in the 1700s. So Pierce, Pierce brought up this idea of abduction because he was talking about the scientific method. He goes, you know, there's another way that's important. He was trying to make sense of the scientific method, which is um, you have a hypothesis, you do an experiment, you look at the results, you go back to your hypothesis, you have this learning cycle. It's a threefold learning cycle. So, okay, so how can he, but see, science uses this all the time, but science never proved the scientific method. You know, science doesn't know if it actually works. It just uses it, right? So that's one of the reasons um, maybe nobody can prove it, but like that shows that science isn't really able to do everything. So Peirce was a great scientist. And so he thought, okay, what do we, what's missing? He said, there's this missing is this thing called abduction. And like Islam said, you know, how do you get your hypothesis? And he gave a nice example. He said, okay, let's say there's some beans near the bag. And you go, oh, I bet you those beans came from the bag, right? Now, that's not logically certain. And it's, 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 you don't really have any evidence for that. <laughs> that's just a good guess. And the more you look at the beans, you see, you say, oh, they're white. These beans are white. The bags in the, the beans in the bag are white. These beans are round. Those are round. These are smooth. Those are smooth, right? These are the certain signs. That say. None of that is actually evidence, but it's um, all supporting a guess. So this idea, like Islam, Decide, discuss like, but it does minimize the surprise. Like once you realize that the beans could have come from the bag, that'll make it less surprising. Okay, so these are three things. And as a philosopher, or as somebody who wants to know everything, or kind of like figure out like how do we you know make this define? The idea is to try to make these very well defined, to try to be able to explain why those three are there more or not. You see, so are these just invented methods? Or are these discovered methods? Have we discovered all three or are there more to discover? So we have this, uh, I, I've been developing this language of wisdom. This is the whole point of Math for Wisdom is to try to learn this language and maybe see where it happens in math, uh, which would be very convincing, but also see where it comes up in different thinkers, uh, which maybe isn't convincing enough, but uh, is still very cool. And so these are the ABCs. So the crucial one for today is you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect. It's the learning cycle. It's basically like the scientific method. Now, you know, is it different than that or not? And so these, uh, it's this is the threesome right here. There's eight frameworks like that. And when you get to, the, I call them divisions of everything because, you know, you could have, let's say, your global workspace in your brain. It could be divided up into three ways of thinking, like, taking a stand, following through, reflecting, or it could be carved up into four levels of knowledge or five levels for decision-making or six for morality or seven for logic. When you get to eight, the whole thing collapses. So you go back in a cycle. And so there's this, and this is of course hypothetical, but uh, I'm building up evidence for this, that you can do reflection and add up perspectives and shift along this eightfold clock. So like if you add one perspective, that's this operation plus one, I'm saying that's the unconscious. Uh, that's just a reflection. If you add two perspectives, that'll be awareness. Uh, so that's like a perspective on a perspective. And if you add three perspectives, that'd be like consciousness. So like perspective on a perspective or perspective. So um, maybe just to give an example, um, if you have like the, you know, God is the zeroth person, I'm the first person, you are the second person, um, he, she, it or is the third person. You could be going through life just in a godly way and just not reflecting at all. But let's suppose then you reflect. So the first level of reflection is go, oh, I am experiencing this. Okay, so that'd be the first experience. That's almost like the unconscious is kind of can kind of make that. But then you can look at yourself and go at yourself. You can say, Andrus, you are experiencing this. And then it'll become very um, cognitive, kind of like I'm erasing myself. OK, I'm erasing the I and I'm saying, no, there's no I, it's you. And then I can look from the side to say, oh, what's this I and you? There was me and then I erased myself. And do they relate or not? OK, so that's also a threesome. And you'll keep seeing more and more threesomes today. But 
it's like having three minds. And so some of this is actually psychologically uh, quite uh, founded, um, although I, I came, you know, I, I developed this independently, but there's a Nobel Prize winning psychologist. He won a prize for economics, uh, Daniel Kahneman. He worked with uh, Amos uh, Tversky. Uh, and uh, they talked about system one and system two, you know, because unconscious and conscious is one of these flaky things uh, in modern psychology. So they said, we're not going to talk about unconscious, conscious. We're just going to call them system one and system two. And he wrote a book, um, Kahneman, called uh, Thinking, Fast and Slow. So he goes, look, we have this mind and they can show, like, do different experiments and show that sometimes the mind is operating in this way where it's super fast, it's very intuitive, it's associative, and they call it system one. But then there's another way it works. And so like, you know, they'll study things like they'll give you two choices uh, in terms of betting, let's say, you know, would you rather have a lottery ticket like this or a lottery ticket like that, you know? And so you think quickly and you make quick decisions, okay? And then you, they pair, they're very, and so they get the underlying logic of that system one, but if they change it a little bit differently, maybe they have you a little bit to pause to think about it or whatever, you know, you can get different results. You get rational results, slower results, conceptual results, deliberate results. Okay. Now I'm saying there should also be a system three. So in my picture, I'm saying, look, you have a, because based on that logical, when you divide everything into seven parts, you're going to have like a logic. For a logic, you need two minds, a mind that knows all the answers, but a mind that doesn't know anything, but's asking questions. And then they come together. So like logic is balancing like what is and what is not, let's say, for example. So in this logical balance, or we'll, it's a notion of dialogue, as Christopher will be giving us uh, you know, later. I'll try to be brief. But um, the unconscious um, is just uh, doing things associatively. It, it's like the Google mind. You know, what's your favorite ice cream? You know. How do you know? Like your retina works. What sees lots of things. Can't explain how it does it. If you try to erase things, things, you get these like bubbles, you get these concepts, you get a language of concepts. So this language of ideas, of concepts, of statements, of rules is being constructed. And of course, it's it's this is like hundreds of millions of neurons and ideas and stuff. This is a uh, to hundreds of thousands of concepts, let's say. But you're trying to match it up. So you match it up. If it's not right, you get lots of emotion. So the unconscious is speaking to us with emotion. But then you try to fix your thing. You try to remodel everything. And what the consciousness is doing, the consciousness is holding the break. The consciousness says, that model's not good enough. That model's not going to work. That model's, and it goes, but then it says, now you've got it right. I will hardwire it. Okay? So it's kind of like that third person looking at the side, at this dialogue between the I and the you. It's saying, okay, now it, you're going to be at peace. I will hardwire it. So this is just a model. Um, I think it's an attractive model. Um, so... We're going to relate this uh, just in terms of Pierce, because he had very similar, you know, I've got my three sums, he's got his three sums. So where are these coming from? We're both very much influenced by Immanuel Kant. And he has this uh, wonderfully difficult book, uh, Critique of Pure Reason, um, which Pierce studied for years, you know, and I studied uh, for a whole year. And maybe it's one of the few books I've actually read, um, but uh, it's fantastic. So Kant tried to, and Kant was dealing with this challenge that Hume said, he goes, look, you don't even know if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You don't know any of these facts, right? So what Kant tried to say was, look, well, the mind and the world are related. They're bridged by these regularities, okay? We can't know anything certain from the world, but we have a notion of certainty inside ourselves. We're built with notions of certainty. So those notions of certainty they have like a logical form. And this is the classic logical form, a uh, deduction, which from Aristotle way back when in the Greek age, like all the beans from the bag are white. These beans are beans from this bag. These beans are going to be white. Okay. It's, but actually, this could be, well, anyway, so this is like logical statements and they have three parts. But a lot of times like X, Y, like X implies Y. Those are three things and they're logically organized, let's say, right? X and Y are linked. Like X, Y follows from X because of this arrow, okay? Because of this reason. So what Kant did, he expanded on uh, Aristotle to say, look, there's not just deduction, but there's these things like induction, but they have the same form, okay? And so when he looked at these things, he came up with these concepts, looking at that equation, at logic in different ways, he'd say, oh, there's one, many, all, like, you, you know, unity, plurality, totality. You can have 
positive statements that are real. You can have negative statements that uh, deny it. You can have, you know, limiting statements that balance this. Um, this one I'll just skip, but well, I guess substance and accidents means you have material, you know, you have things and they have properties. You have cause and you can have effect. Uh, you can have reciprocity. This one actually scratched out, but this one I kept a possibility, existence or actuality, necessity. So these are 12 things. Now, they didn't work. Um, he, he, science never used this. He was very disappointed. Okay. But Pierce went back to that. He goes, you know, the essence of that is this firstness, secondness, thirdness. And so this kind of very much relates to the three minds I said, you know, uh, you know, like you have a mind that's saying, this is how it is. Let's say that positivity, you can have a mind that's saying, no, <laughs> it's not like, you know, let's, let's throw that away. We're going to have negativity. You can have a third mind that kind of gets a boundary between like what is and what is not. So basically the first uh, ness would be like this type of mind where you have quality, you just have experience. And that's everything is experienced. When you get this second mind, you get like correlates and relates. Like you can get things that related. When you get a third mind, then you have like a language of signs. So this sign stands for this object. And it's by way of this interpretant. So three different types of things. And so I just looked this up on Google very quickly. But uh, everything he did kind of he related it back to this first and the second mysterious first and the second is thirdness. Um, um, where he would say, look, abduction is about this part, and it's about potentiality, okay? Like, what could, these are things that could be true, not necessarily. Deduction is about what's necessary, he goes, hmm, like actuality, I guess he's saying, and induction is generality, okay? I would probably disagree with that, but but you can see we're kind of, well, I'll show you, we're kind of thinking a similar way. Now, um, okay. Going back to here, like I have this take a stand, follow through and reflect. That's like uh, deep inside of us. But when you have to try to use that and conceive that, you have to do it on one of four levels. And this is like this weather, what, how, why. So you could have things that are uh, true for three different reasons. They're true because they're necessarily true. Like, you know, the contra it'd be contradictory if they weren't true. That's kind of like with deduction, you have that. Or, well, let's see, contradictory. Then you could have things that are actually true because they're true because they're consequences of something else that's true. Okay, it's called grounds and consequences. Or you could think they're true, true, possibly true because they're consistent. Okay, so the types of triples like uh, object, process, subject, one, all, many, being, doing. Now this is the one I add to Kant because he didn't believe in Descartes. He didn't think that. But I said, look, you can have a logical system. Where like your being or doing your thinking, like I think, therefore I am, would mean like you know, if I can't encompass my uh, thinking, then I can't encompass the being. You know, if you can't encompass the thing, you can't encompass the thinker. Okay, if you can't encompass uh, the thinker, you can't ex encompass um, the. Oh, I'm sorry. If you can't encompass the thinking, you can't encompass the being. If you can't encompass the being, you can't encompass the doing because it manifests itself through action. If you can't encompass the action, then you can't encompass the thinking that reflects upon it. Okay, so there's this kind of three cycle. So he denied that, but I'm saying, look, that's very real, these modes. And so my model, when I try to explain this, uh, which is kind of similar, I'm saying, look, we have facts and we have something like rules. So there's a world of facts out there we don't have access to, but like our unconscious basically is hooked into that world. Our unconscious is part of that world, let's say, right? It's wired into that world. And that's where we get our world of facts. And abduction is going to go from facts and get new facts associatively. Okay, so there's this associativity. Deduction is this world, this language of rules. Okay, so you have some kind of rule and you get another rule from it. And what induction is going to do, induction is going to take facts and turn them into rules. But what the consciousness is doing, the consciousness is taking rules and treating them like facts. So we get a lot of prejudices actually from the consciousness because you could say, oh, you know, all Lithuanians are chess players, right? So that was a rule that you're going to turn into a fact, right? Uh, then you can treat it like a fact. So you'll get a prejudice, let's say. So one key thing I want to say, and I'll be concluding shortly, I hope, but uh, this element of surprise uh, that uh, Aslam talked about, you see how 
am I looking at these things in peers? Like I was, Aslam and I talked and I realized there's some kind of tricky thing. There's like two ways to think about all this. But a key to this is the notion of surprise uh, because abduction is about reducing surprise, okay? So uh, just briefly, I have this, because in this wondrous wisdom, I have this model of emotional life. And it's saying that just like as, um, Pierce was uh, just saying, it's based on expectations, okay? So if I expect um, something's going to happen, I'll be surprised if it doesn't, but excited if it does, okay? For things that aren't important, like, you know, those beans. Oh, the beans did come from the bag, okay? Uh, no, where do these beans come? I'm sorry, where do these beans come from? Okay, I've never seen those beans. But I'll be excited, oh, those beans came from the bag, okay? This all makes sense, right? But if if it was something I cared about, like, oh, why didn't my sweetheart show up? You see, I'm not going to be surprised. I'm going to be sad, right? But if she did show up, I'll be happy, right? Okay, so some of us can relate to that. So this moment of surprise helps to analyze these three things. It's saying that when there's deduction, there's no surprise. It's a non-issue. Uh, see, oh, so that the whole deal with surprise and sadness is that if there's a boundary between theory and practice, you know, if there's a boundary between self and world, then you can have surprise, you can have sadness. If there's not, you're not going to have anything. So deductions may be almost saying like there isn't any even issue. You know, there's not any surprise. It's absolutely certain. It's all logically the case. Now, what induction is doing, it's setting up this uh, partial evidence. Okay. It's saying, look, one more bean was white. One more bean was white. Every time you get another bean, it looks like this is going to be stronger, stronger, but it's never certain. But what you're doing, uh, and this is a notion from Claude Shannon's information theory, which is uh, discovered in the 20th century. It's uh, important in communication and entropy and things like that. The more you build this up, the bigger you're setting up the surprise when you find that uh, navy bean, right? You find that kidney bean, right? Or you find that gold nugget, whatever it is. So you're setting up surprise. What abduction does, it's reducing the surprise. You're saying, hmm, wow, where do these beans come from? But you're associative mind is uh, going through all that and it's saying, hey, uh, those, uh, you know, this will be less surprising if they came from the bag. So some people can even think of like the neurology, um, and I think this is maybe Carl Furston's theory, like the whole brain is a machine whose purpose is to reduce surprise. Okay, so abduction would be a natural way that that happens. And so um, let me see one more. Oh, so just to go back to here, um, Oh, so just to emphasize, let's see. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to mention like, so facts are becoming, so what the beautiful thing about wondrous wisdom is that it can maybe explain, you know, as Kant was trying to, or Pierce was trying to do, why are there only three kinds, you see? Why are there not more kinds of reasoning? It's saying, well, really there's a fourth kind, but we just don't notice. The consciousness binds things, okay? So it's not even reasoning. It's kind of like, you know, um, it's just happening unconsciously. But uh, part of that is abduction. So a lot of the abduction is in this world of facts. You have a fact, you get a fact. That's happening mostly unconsciously, but sometimes we become aware of it, right? Or we can kind of like use, so for example, Krista will talk about how can we use this? Maybe that'll come up in the dialogue. Induction is turning facts into rules. Deduction is taking rules into rules. Uh, consciousness is turning the rules, treating them like facts. So finally, and this is the last slide, um, saying that um, it's really about experimentation. But what I realized was that Pierce and Andres are thinking about very different experimentation in very different ways. In both cases, it's about taking a stand, following through, and reflecting. But see, when I'm talking about this three cycle, I'm saying it's not a matter of knowledge. The knowledge requires the foursome. The knowledge requires four levels of knowledge. The knowledge requires us to imagine that there's something beyond us, this knowledge that we can access. But see, we can do learning without any knowledge because we are able to program ourselves. You see, we can hardwire ourselves. So when you do an experiment with yourself, uh, you're maximizing your own learning uh, just by changing yourself, by adapting yourself, okay? You don't need to know anything. You just change yourself, right? So, so in that case, what I think you're doing is you're deducing, and this maybe is flipped back. So the first thing is taking a step on the you can do it without knowledge. What what um, Pierce basically said was, hey, but in the case of knowledge, you see, you would start with hypothesis, like your best guess that your unconscious gave you. 
then you would um, make uh, use your deduction to figure out a nice experiment. What would be the experiment that would really kind of make it logically testable, right? Okay, put it to the side. Then you would collect evidence and draw the conclusion in favor or not. That'd be the induction, okay? So you get a great idea, curious idea. You set up an experimental de design. That's where your deduction is taking place. And then you're um, using induction to get the results reflecting. But see, when you're, when you're going back and say, I want to consciously grow, I think it flips around. Because when you want to consciously grow, you say, hey, I'm not going to just chase any crazy idea. I'm going to spend a lot of energy logically thinking through, like, what is the position to have? What is the hypothesis I want to have, right? What's the best important, best hypothesis to have? Then when I want to experiment, I'll be experimenting on myself. I'm going to come up with all the kind of different paths that it could lead me on, you see. All the, so I'll be using abduction to experiment with myself. Basically, I'll be experimenting with my unconscious. Then I'll reflect on that, okay? So in our case, uh, we're perfecting ourselves. We are the experiment. We're maximizing learning. But Pierce is talking about the scientific method. Um, so he's minimizing surprise. Uh, we are not the experiment perfecting our knowledge. So let me, uh, that's, any questions or thought on this? Uh, of course, you're smiling. I don't know if that's, are we happy? <laughs> It's a lot to take in. Well, and so this is like in my mind, a small little piece of what it means to have this language of frameworks. But see what it allows. It says, then I can talk to someone like Aristotle. I can talk to Kant. I can talk to Pierce. I can talk to Islam. I can talk to you. And I don't need um, one year. You see, like I was able to come up with all this. Now people could work if you didn't have this. You see, imagine trying to think of these ideas without having this, right? Like, even if these ideas are wrong, but if you don't have this, you could spend 10 years, you know, to come up with what I said. Now, maybe it'll be, but in the end, you want to have this type of language to put that kind of thing together. You see, that's the whole point of wondrous wisdom, to create a language. And so it's also exciting for me, like a lot of this was done independently, but then I read about Kahneman. I go, oh, he talks about system one, system two. I bet you it's this, I bet you it's that, you see. So to be able to relate modern psychology or, or Shannon's theory, for example, Shannon based on surprise, you know, it turns out, oh, surprise. I know who talks about surprise. So one of the nice things is that this is something that tries to harmonize different people's ideas. I'm not, there's not a single person here. I said, you know, oh, I don't agree with them. Well, I kind of maybe could disagree with Pierce, but you know, mostly I agree, but on small points, I might disagree, you know, but I could try to explain why, you know, it turns out maybe he, he has his reason to talk, you know, it turns out I'm talking about different things. That's the typical thing, right? So maybe um, we could, I need to take a short break, but um, why don't we uh, give you a chance to um, talk to each other? I'll take a three minute break. Um, then you'll have a chance to ask questions, but you don't have to, and then we'll proceed with the dialogue part. Is that fine? Okay. Okay, then I, I give myself a break. That was, you know, I have to, I have to go back and watch the, the video, of course, the recording. Uh, where do you think, Sam? You know, I I heard this thing a few days ago about how um, it takes like several dozen or even upwards of a couple hundred different attempts to create and solidify a new neuron in our brain. Unless it's done through play, then it only takes like three or four attempts. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't know if that relates to this discussion of knowledge and whatnot, but the attempts to retain knowledge it seems to, uh, according to the study is more effective if you learn it through play rather than just um you know grinding at it interesting so. often, like the play has, has several meanings what in what way well, I think it's just meant that, like, you're having fun while you're doing it, right? So if you're having fun, your ability to retain the knowledge that you've gained when you're having fun, you know, it only takes you a couple repetitions to learn something 
versus if you're not having fun, then it might take you several dozen or maybe even hundreds of attempts to try to like solidify that knowledge, you know? Interesting. That's, that's a very interesting insight. I, w I was thinking about, I've written metaphysics um, and the theory of everything and how a universe is, uh, comes um, by and so. And I was wondering, what did I do? Because I, I thought I was using just logic, um, that if there, there had to be a creator, and if there is a creator, that could not be limited. So it has to be infinite in every way. Um, and from that, I reached the conclusion that it has to be infinite fast, uh, for example. And have infinite consciousness. So, what what kind of reason? What what did I use? Was it deduction or abduction? Mm. Andrews, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's a nice example. Like, I think you're riffing with abduction, right? You know, you found some beans. You go. You know, those beans must have come from that bag, right? So, you know, like you, you know, like you're saying, oh. Uh, this happens, so, you know, it has to happen infinitely fast, right? Well, that's a jump, right? <laughs> like, it could be, of course, it could be true. That's where we get ideas from. But so this kind of leaping, 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 right? Like, um, that's associative thinking. Um, uh, but, uh, and so what Pierce is saying, like, that has a fundamental role. So maybe I should emphasize, like, why was Pierce doing this? Because he was trying to say that the scientific method is sensible, and that all these three methods only make sense when you include them in one framework. So definitely you want to be good at guessing. You want to be good at abduction. But if you have a system that's only guessing, like uh, that is not going to be uh, something that anybody could lean on. You know, it becomes very personal, private. It's only your brain that thinks that way. You see, those are your guesses. That's what you end up with, you know, personal guesses. So is there an alternative, right, to personal guessing? And so to insist that other people use your personal guesses, you know, that becomes very tough. Like, so what I'm trying to, you know, and so this is maybe a nice chance to show like, you know, so this was a topic Aslam brought up. He goes, oh, you know, and then I went, now I, I like Pierce for different reasons. I never really kind of studied this and I, I never really could find a connection. But see, now after decades to say, oh, now I think I know what he means by firstness, secondness, thirdness. <laughs> because for years I couldn't figure out like, what is he talking about? Like, you know, you kind of get any so this idea that, oh, people can be on the same wavelength, you know, people can have the same mind. It's a little bit maybe uh, like um, uh, I overheard Samuel say, oh, like what makes things more fun? So like with music, you have uh, scales, let's say, right? Do they make music more fun or less fun? Well, try it without any, try just, you know, banging on drums, you know, like, okay, like drumming can be done, right, without scales, I guess, but um, it probably makes it more fun, you know, to have, uh, to have, to have that structure. Now, is it absolutely true? Well, so the point being that if this stuff uh, can, so first of all, can it be fun? Can it be useful? Like, you know, and if it's fun, like he said, uh, you you learn more. It's it's easier to learn, you know, it changes your attitude. So, uh, so pairing abduction with this kind of deductive, so kind of like what you're doing, Christopher, like you're taking your guesses, but you're making a system out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes it um, uh, somehow expands on the fun. It becomes a game, right? like Harry Potter's world, right? Like, so Harry Potter has this world. Now, Harry Potter's world can be a useful metaphor, like John Brett said, you know, it can affect people, but maybe there's more to it than that. It can kind of become something that maybe becomes developed more at a certain point where you can start to get real relationships that should be tested. So to say, but to, to do that, um, the key thing I've been doing is trying to erase the unconscious to say if you absolutely ignore the unconscious ignore all the guesses what are you left with when you don't allow yourself to guess anything you see when you refuse when you throw away all the guesses when you throw away everything in the universe when you throw everything you know what are you left with but you probably are left with like this firstness secondness thirdness you start to see traces of that you see there's this impulse to guess right like you don't have a guess but you have that impulse right like you have that impulse, you know, you have that first perspective, that second perspective. So this whole house of perspectives. Um, and so that uh, people, and so 
maybe to say the, of making a language, right? Like, so it's a nonverbal language, okay? Throw away all the words. What can you think without verbs? So like, if I saw someone from China, if I saw an extraterrestrial, but I could draw a three cycle, they go, oh, we have that three cycle. That's how we learn, right? So it doesn't, now which one do you start with? It probably doesn't matter. You see, so, but the point is, is that they see the three cycle. So, uh, and so that's why math is kind of interesting because uh, math has that um, solidity and then math has those types of structures. If this can pop up in math, it becomes exciting that, well, because you see the point is, is that now if we worked as a team, if we said, oh, we're going to work as a team, then we got 20 thinkers, 100 thinkers say, look, they all use this. That'll work. But if I write an encyclopedia where say everyone uses that, people say, that's just you. That's your game, right? That's just you. That's your guessing. But if we have a community that says, oh, no, we have a scientific community that looks at 100 thinkers and we just connect them all and connect us all our things. Or like to take, for example, you have a metaphysics. Can we strip it down, Christer, and just throw away 90% but save the 10% that's actually revealing of maybe something universal? You know, of course, you can for your novels and et cetera, you know, for your musical, you can keep the other 90%. But if we strip it out, so with Jerry Northrup, that's what we're doing with this language of wisdom study group. So I think those are the main things I wanted to get across. So why don't we then, uh, if there, unless there's any comments, then why don't I hand it over to Christer? Do I get some applause or? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I do want to make a comment actually. Yeah. Um, going back to the, the beans, uh, this might be splitting hairs, but I think everything starts with the assumption that these are beans, right? Uh, how do you know mm -hmm. they're beans in the first place? Um, maybe your mom told you as a kid, this is what beans look like, but yeah. at some point in your journey, you have to start with an assumption that either these are beans or that your mom is telling you the truth or, you know, like there's no escaping that first assumption that, that, these beans belong in this bag or whatever, you know, and where does that come from? And, and so that Islam, seems to be. Uh, just yeah. to reply, but so that's a point Islam made uh, two weeks ago. Basically, it's a sociological point. And it's basically saying, look, like you can't just uh, take things. You know, the categories that we have came from somewhere. So when you look at beans, like you're saying, first of all, like who came up with this whole notion of beans, right? Like maybe they're just seeds, right? Or maybe they're just simply organic material, right? Or maybe they're just atoms. Matter, right? right? Yeah, right. or, you know, what made them white beans? Like who came up with this color white? Because obviously there's not white. They're like off-white or whatever there is, right? So the idea being that like there are words, those aren't really words. They're some kind of concepts, you know, socially we use them as words, but you do see the two minds. You've got these images and experiences, you know, and personal, you know, knowledge, you have this language of concepts that you've been socialized to have, you know, and you it's partly internally, partly like with these words, hooks, you know, into that. And they have these matchings. And your consciousness participated in matching that up. And that's the whole point of the consciousness is that, you know, you keep them honest, right? Like, so you have two different ways of looking at things like a male. I mean, it's, it's like having two genders. Like, so you have a female intuitive way and then you have a male conceptual way. We both have these two hemispheres of the brain. But neither of them makes us human. It's the fact that we combine the two that makes us human. So, so in those questions you raise, it seems like that's just kind of suggesting, well, we need all three of that to solve that problem. And that's basically what Pierce was saying. He invented semiotics as the study of signs, saying that, well, you've got the object, the bean. You've got a sign for that, which could be a word or mental picture or whatever. And then you have the interpretant, right? So, Jerry, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say that it really doesn't matter where you start. You come along and there's a bag on the floor and there's some white beans next to it. You stick your hand in and you pour those out. They're all white. It doesn't matter whether they're beans, whether it's a bag, whether it's fish in a box, mm -hmm. or bees in a hive, whatever it is. You know, you come across a situation and say, okay, what is this? Um, and and so without any words, you can do thinking. You know, yeah, you can you, don't you can find the words. beans and abduct. Oh, yeah. they're from Stick this. Your hand in. There's you something can, there. You, you can put it take on the ground. There's all the beans there. and spill them out, and then go through all the beans and induct. You know, they're all white, and then you can deduct. Well, if these were all white, 
and they were taken from this, then the deduction was, well, then it had to be white, right? So all three are taking place uh, without any words. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. Sign up on Patreon. You just do it. You go to the webpage, you fill in a few things, boom! You're a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom. That easy.